All right. Morning, Severn. How we doing? Well, my name is Ryan Cox, and I am pleased to welcome you to week five from our series from the book of Ephesians called Brand New. We're going to crack open chapter three, verses one through 13 this morning. I'm going to read that, and we're going to get rolling. It says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, you have heard, haven't you, about the administration of God's grace that he gave to me for you? The mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written above. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight about the mystery of the Messiah. This was not made known to people in other generations, as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of the Messiah and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to his eternal purpose accomplished in the Messiah, Jesus our Lord. In him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. That's what we're going to look at today. So right out the gate, there, there's two things that caught my eye that kind of set uh, these verses 1 through 13 apart. Number one, um, there's a dash. All right, right, right in the beginning here in, in verse 1, it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, dash. And everything after that is Paul basically interrupting his own train of thought. So, so really... Um, Paul had an, a, a, something on his mind that, that he starts to say in verse 1, and he actually doesn't pick up what he was originally going to say until verse 14. So, so verses 2 through 13 is really Paul, under the inspiration of God, interrupting his original train of thought to tell us whatever he wanted to tell us, whatever God wanted him to tell us in these verses, which is very interesting. But secondly, what's unique about these verses is that they mark the very first time in the book of Ephesians that Paul is talking about himself. Because prior to this in the book of Ephesians, he hasn't done that. Uh, he, he, you know, when he started off the book in verses 3 through 14, he explains how every blessing belonged to the Ephesians in Christ Jesus and what those blessings were. And uh, late in chapter 1, he, he, he prays for the Ephesians that they would grow in the knowledge of God and all that he's done for them. And, and in chapter 2, he explains what Jesus is Christ, what Jesus Christ's sacrifice has done for us, how it makes unity possible between mankind and God and between Jew and Gentile. But in these verses, verses, he kind of takes a break from all that and he's, he's, he's kind of just given a personal testimony. He says, I, Paul, uh, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, he said, um, you've heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave to me. This, this ministry, this mystery was made known to me. By reading this, you're able to understand my insight. I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions. Uh, he's, he's really just talking about himself here. And uh, while I was studying this passage, what I found is that a lot of... Um, a lot of pastors actually don't necessarily, or, or preachers, won't even really uh, pick this part, pick this text open on a Sunday morning. They just kind of gloss over it because they're not really sure what to do with it. Um, for those of you that are joining us for, for the first time or, or uh, you know, haven't been here very long, I just want to make this real clear. It is my firm conviction, and it is the stance of this church, that um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every single word. And so... Um, Everything in here, there's no such thing as, as filler. There's no such thing as, you know, God didn't really have a point to make, so we just let Paul take a few verses. Uh, there's no such thing as wasted words here. If, if we believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, that means if anything in here was not in here, then we would be missing something that we needed. And so I know, I'm, I'm moved by the conviction that these words will speak life to us when we look at what they really have to say and we submit ourselves to what God has to say through his author Paul here. And so that, that leads me to the question that I always ask when I read the Bible, why? Why in the book of Ephesians would, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, why would Paul kind of take a, a moment to talk about himself and hold up his own life and, and what God had shown him and what God had done and was doing and would do through him? And, and the, the answer to that question, I think, is, is probably a little bit simpler uh, than, than, than um, you might think at first. And I think it's very simply because Paul knew that the Ephesian believers needed an example. 
See, prior to this point in the book of, of Ephesians, he's been telling them a lot of things. He's been giving them a lot of concepts, but now he's showing them through his own life how those are meant to be lived out. And, and the bottom line is, you and I know this, the lives that we live speak a whole lot more loudly than the words that we say, amen? I, I've seen this personally in my own life. I, I, uh, I talk often about you know, my time in the fire service, and I, I think I've even referenced this before, but I remember... Um, there was one man in particular that had a real profound impact on my life during the time that I was a firefighter. His name was Chief McNally. And uh, Chief McNally had more time in the fire service than I had breathing when I came on as a firefighter. I was about a 23, 24 year old rookie, and he was a, a fire chief that had had more than 30 years in the service. But what what moved me about that, that man and uh, what has, has obviously left a lasting impact on my life is that even with all that time in the fire service, every night after dinner, he'd roll up his sleeves and he'd do the dishes with me. Now, the reason that this really impacted me is because very few jobs have a tendency to, to draw people with such um, enormous but also frail egos as the fire service. And, and what, what, I, what you see happen time after time is, um, you know, guys will get into the academy and, and they understand they're a rookie and, you know, it was, it was a blessing to get the call to, to be invited to the academy. But, you know, then you graduate and you get a little bit of time under your belt and you start running some calls and you start thinking you're a hero. And all of a sudden you're too good for those menial tasks like scrubbing toilets and doing dishes. Um, it, it's, a, it's a sense of entitlement that just... It's in the heart of man. You see it everywhere. But, it, you know, I specifically remember seeing it in the fire service. But over against that, here I had a 30-year chief who would do the dishes with, with me. Uh, I've never seen another chief in, in the four years I was a firefighter. I never saw another chief do that. I never saw another chief do housework, let alone next to a rookie that was, had less time alive than he had in the fire service. And, and the fact that I still remember this so vividly really proves the point that I'm trying to make, that the examples, the lives that we live, um, they, they just have a way of impacting the people around us. And so uh, the reason I think this text can be so powerful, especially when you get into the minds of the Ephesians, is, is when you consider that Paul is really letting them and us some 2,000 years later into his life. And so when I read this text this week through that lens, I, I, I saw three big ideas that we can see in, in, in Paul's life based on um, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. So let me start in verse 1. And we'll roll through this. It says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. And I actually just want to stop there. We don't have to go very far before something catches our eye in the Bible. Um, something to consider when you read, especially the letters of Paul, is that uh, for, for at least four of his letters, he wrote them when he was in a Roman jail cell. And Ephesians is one of those letters. So when Paul, about 2,000 years ago, was inspired by the word of God to write this letter, he was physically a prisoner in Rome, in a jail cell. He had a nightmare of a life that led up to this. I mean, uh, accused of crimes that he didn't commit by his own people, that he dedicated his life to, to preaching the gospel to. They're trying to kill him, so he gets, you know, basically locked up in the Roman judicial system, punted around. There's all kinds of red tape. Years go by without any leader having the courage to say that he's innocent, so he has to appeal to Caesar. Boat wreck after snake bite after country song of a life is basically what this guy lived. And then he gets to, to Rome, and, he's, and he writes the, the book of Ephesians. Um, the first thing that strikes me, and in Paul's little autobiography here, is how he identifies himself. Because to anybody else on the outside of Paul's life, they would have said he's a prisoner of Rome. But Paul does not call himself a prisoner of Rome. He doesn't call himself a prisoner of men. The very first thing that he says is his identity. And he says that he is a prisoner of, or other translations will say, a prisoner for Jesus Christ. And so when I talk about the example that Paul's leaving for us here and why this is so important for us, the very first thing that I see in the life of Paul is demonstrated for us is going to be our first point in today's teaching. And it's that absolutely nothing can change who we are in Jesus. Nothing changes who we are in Jesus. Our failures this week, this month, this year don't change who we are in Jesus. Our performance doesn't change that. And, and, and especially significant in Paul's words here, our current circumstance, whatever God has, has called us to walk through, does not change. We're never a victim of our circumstances. Our identity ultimately is derived based on our standing as given to us in Jesus Christ. I, I, um, 
This week I found out that I uh, uh, evidently have a, an up-and-coming theologian budding in my family. And, uh, and one of my cousins texted me a deep theological question, which I like. That's how I'm wired. And, and, and uh, I guess this was an assignment for school. So he actually could have been using me to cheat. I'm not entirely sure, but I don't care. I had fun answering his question. So he asked me if it's ever okay for a Christian to hide their Christianity. Deep thinker. I was like, okay, all right got a theologian in our midst. And so I got thinking about that, and I very quickly arrived at the conclusion, which is no. But what was good about that question is it, it, it caused me to think through that. Why is it wrong for a Christian to hide their Christianity? The more that I thought about that question, the more I realized that is actually a wrong question. Because when you, when you ask the question, is it okay for me to hide my Christianity, you've made an assumption. And the assumption is that your Christianity is only part of who you are, and you're already wrong. Jesus proved this when he dealt with the rich young ruler, a very famous episode. The rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus very surprisingly says, well, you know, here's the law, and he gives him some commands, and the rich young ruler says, you know, I've done all of those things from my youth, and then he asked the fateful question that evidently Jesus was trying to get him to reveal. Rich young ruler said, I've done all those things from my youth, what do I still lack? And in asking that question, the rich young ruler betrayed something about himself, that he believed that Christianity was simply something that you could add to the rest of your life. And Christianity is not an addition to our lives. It's a brand new way of life. So I I stand on this stage, you know, we we usually think in terms of, you know, you have your profession and so, so, you know, I'm 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 a pastor and I'm also a husband and I'm also a father and I'm also a son and I'm also a, you know, fill in the blank here. And then it's easy to say, and I'm also a Christian in addition to those things, but that's incorrect to think that way. Christianity is not an, not an addition to the rest of the things that I have going on. Christianity is meant to permeate and redefine ev- absolutely every aspect of my life. That's why the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they don't have a new creation. They are a new creation. That's what it means to be a Christian. And this idea is something you, basically I have seen in every single text that we've studied thus far in the book of Ephesians. And the, the cool part of moving through Ephesians now is over the last two years, I've had the opportunity to walk through Philippians and Colossians, which were two other letters of Paul. We spent almost 30 weeks in those books put together. And when you hold up their themes versus uh, uh, Ephesians, it's very clear that more so in any other book he wrote, Paul was inspired by God to drive home the theme of, of finding our identity in the finished work of Jesus. You see this everywhere. Right in, the, right in the first chapter of this book, Paul like screams out the gate with this you know, 11 verse long sentence where he tells us, he starts off by saying that we are chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in the eyes of God. I mean, just consider that for a moment. That, all that is, that's, that's telling us about our identity. That before the foundation of the world, God decided that we would be something that we could never be apart from him. Holy and blameless. You never would have been holy or blameless by your own effort. That's an identity that God decided to give you if you name Jesus Lord and Savior. He said that we've been predestined. I know that's a terrifying word to use on a Sunday morning. We have been, it means decided beforehand. Before you write me an angry email, go ahead and look that up in the Greek. It says we have been predestined to be adopted into God's family as his children, meaning God decided beforehand to give us an identity, not just as his servants or his slaves or his workers, but his children as sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's incredible. Paul said, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then in verse 14, he said that we have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, the, the, the down payment, the guarantee of our inheritance. Out the gate, he just re- keeps reminding us of what God has done on our behalf and how our whole lives rest on what he's done, not on what we do. In the, in the second half of, ver- of uh, chapter one, in verses 15 through 23, if you remember, Paul just prays that the Ephesians, not that they would work a lot harder, Not that they would, you know, stumble into some kind of new knowledge, just that their knowledge would deepen of who God is and what he'd done for them and how their whole lives rested on what he'd done. In chapter two, in the the, uh, first half of chapter two, one through 10, Paul says, listen, you were once dead in your trespasses and sins, slaves to your own desires, but God raised you to new life in Jesus, seated you in the heavens with Jesus, created you Brand new in Jesus for good works which he prepared in, beforehand that we should walk in them. He's talking about the same thing there. That in Jesus we are made something that we could never be. And then in the second half of chapter 2, if you were here last week, Paul concluded that section by saying, so the moment that we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we're no longer strangers and aliens and outsiders. 
We're fellow citizens with the saints and we're fellow members of God's family, citizens and sons and daughters. That's what happens to us when we give our lives to Jesus. So you look at this repeated theme throughout the, the, uh, the first two chapters of Ephesians. It's kind of incredible to me. Paul didn't know if he was ever going to see these people again. He's got a six-chapter book to you know, tell them everything that they needed to know. Two chapters have gone by. He has not given them a single command. Hasn't told, he hasn't given us any instruction whatsoever. He's just repeatedly, from every angle imaginable, reminded us that God has made us something that we could never be. It's clearly a theme in this book. And what, what you're seeing in just this first verse here in chapter three, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, is really Paul is showing, he's leading by example, he's teaching us what we're supposed to do with that truth. It, the, the, uh, the things that we read about in the Bible are not meant to make us say, wow, that made me feel awesome for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. Let me walk away from it. We will never see any, any real depth or growth in our life if that's what our walk with God boils down to. And, and, and you know, the, the, the amazing truths of the gospel are not meant to just evoke a round of applause at the end of a 30, 40 minute teaching. These are truths that we have to put on, that we need to remind ourselves of on the daily. And so Paul, before he says anything else about who he is, showing us by his example, he's, he, he's reminding us that what we have to do is start. The starting point in our lives needs to be our identity that Jesus Christ has given to us, that we could never create for ourselves. Nothing changes who we are in Jesus. I'm gonna make a bold statement. This, this, uh, this might sound like a sweeping generalization, but think about this this week. I honestly believe that every single struggle that you and I have as God's people and every single failure that we have in our lives ultimately stems from a failure to remember this. You struggle with condemnation, it's because you've forgotten this. Or you struggle the opposite end of the spectrum with arrogance. It's because you've forgotten this. Yeah, a lot of times people want to believe that the reason that they struggle with sin and you know, an ongoing pattern of sin in their life is simply because they're not trying hard enough to be a better version of themselves. But the entire book of Galatians was written to speak against that nonsense. Paul reprimanded the Galatians by saying, listen, you started this thing, this relationship with God in the spirit. You honestly think you're gonna complete this. You're gonna make yourself who you need to be by works of your own hands, complete it in the flesh, is what he says. See, Christianity is not, Christians aren't people who go through life constantly trying to be something that they're not and then beat themselves up when they fail. They're people who repeatedly go back to the reality that in Jesus, we are already made something that we could never be outside of him. I found this in a commentary a year ago and, it, and it, it, it changed the way I thought about Christianity and what our effort is actually supposed to be like. It says the remainder of our earthly lives as God's people is an outworking of what God has already in worked. We are called to become what we are. This is the mighty imperative of Christian ethics. Every other ethical system calls us to the costly effort of becoming what we are not. But in the full salvation already bequeathed to us in Christ, the new nature is already ours, waiting for expression, poised for growth until its potential is triggered by our obedience to the word of God. It's saying the same thing here. Everything in our life, our health and growth and development as God's people ultimately goes back to us driving from our mind to our heart the reality that Jesus Christ has made us something that, that we could never be. Let me, let me just ask you something real quick. Whatever you brought to the table this morning, and I know you brought something, whether you realize it or not, you got something you're carrying around. How much different would your life be if you really believed what the Bible says about you because of Jesus? That before the foundation of the world, God had you on his mind and had determined, I'm gonna make that one holy and blameless. Knowing everything that you would struggle with, everything that you would mess up, he decided before you drew your first breath to take you by the hand and make you something you could never be. Consider for a moment, just like let's pretend like we don't hear this every Sunday. Consider for a moment that the moment you gave your life to Jesus, your sin is far removed from you as the east is from the west. When God sees you, he doesn't see you the way that you see yourself. 1 Corinthians 1.21, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in Jesus we could be God's righteousness. 
That means when God looks at one of his children who has surrendered their life to him, he sees his own perfect, sinless righteousness staring him back in the face. How much different would your life look? Would your outlook be? Would everything about you be if you really believe that? And what I think is so noteworthy when you look in context here, Paul's saying he's the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. You remember Paul experienced an inordinate, an unbelievable amount of suffering because of his obedience to Jesus. He was called to be a missionary to the Gentiles, which is, it's, it's important for us to remember that Paul's suffering was a, he, it was a direct result of his obedience to God. Here's why this is important to remember because we live in a culture that has somewhere popularized and actually chosen to believe what's called prosperity preaching or health and wealth gospel, which is, it, 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 it teaches that there's, that God's desire is to give us the, you know, the easiest, most comfortable life possible on this side of eternity. And that there's a way in which if we live a good enough life, then God's going to spare us from difficulty. Biblically, the exact opposite is repeated for us time and time and time again. I can't imagine how offensive Paul would have believed that to be. You look at a guy that five times was whipped with the 39 lashes, which Jesus received before he went to his crucifixion. Five times, Paul was whipped 39 times. Meaning, like, think about what his back looked like. Think about what his entire body looked like, covered from head to toe in scars that he would never heal from. Three times he was beaten with rods. That was a Roman form of torture. And, And oftentimes, after just one of those episodes, you'd be walking with a limp for the rest of your life. Three times, God walked Paul through that kind of suffering. All kinds of shipwrecks and getting stranded on an island and getting bit by a snake and having friends abandon him and having the weight of churches on him. This guy experienced an unbelievable amount of suffering for his obedience to the calling that God had on his life. But the question when I look at Paul, he's like a New Testament kind of Superman. It's almost irritating. And the question that that I ask myself repeatedly when I look at the man's life is, how? How was he able to maintain his buoyancy and his endurance? How was he able to go through life with his head up? Because for the average American Christian in 2016, it really doesn't take a whole lot to break us. Right? We go to McDonald's and get a Dr. Pepper instead of the Coke that we ordered, and all of a sudden, God's forsaken us. Let's sit him out. I can't do this anymore. And then I can't go to church for, for, for a month because he's forsaken me. He's broken his end of the deal. Meanwhile, you throw Paul in the stocks in a jail cell and at midnight he's singing songs until an angel breaks him out. You try to kill him. You threaten to take his life from him. He says, well, to live is, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Let's get it over with. You try to torture him. He says, I consider the present sufferings of this time not worth to being compared to the future glory to be revealed. He just, he was like, he's Teflon. Nothing stuck to him. And it raises the question, how does a man move through life like that? And the answer is in the very, it's the first few words here. It's he never lost his identity. If you follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, whatever any other preacher will tell you, I'll just let you know, suffering is not far from you. Sacrifice will be required of you. It was required of Jesus. He said, if you you live like him, people are gonna treat you like him. We will experience loss if we're faithful to Jesus. And when that happens, if we don't have a good grasp of our identity in him, then it'll break us. Few things like suffering really shows us what's actually going on in our hearts. And in that sense, suffering is actually a gift. But even with whatever we would call a strong Christian, this happens. When John the Baptist was in prison, he sent his disciples to Jesus and asked Jesus, are you the one that we've been waiting for or should we wait for another? John the Baptist had a crisis of faith when his life got thick enough. If he did, then none of us are beyond that. And the way that we survive suffering, the way that we keep our head up is by remembering who Jesus has made us. If, if you lose sight of that, then suffering's either gonna make you angry at God and bitter toward God, or it's gonna make you hate yourself and you'll tell yourself that God must hate you and if you were just a better person, then you would be spared this kind of life and maybe there's some sin that you're not aware of and you become a victim of your circumstances. But Paul never played either of those games. He was never a product of his circumstances because he knew he had something that went beyond his circumstances. He knew that even in a jail cell, what nobody could take from him is who Jesus had already made him. He knew that he wasn't a prisoner of Rome, he was a prisoner of Jesus. And in Jesus, he was already free. Nothing changes who we are in Jesus. After we see uh, just those first few words there, as much as there is to unpack, I I gotta move on. After Paul demonstrates this, his identity, uh, he talks about the divine revelation that God gave him. and And he refers to it multiple times in these verses as a mystery. 
uh, a mysterion is the Greek word. And, and uh, he keeps referring to this mystery that God had previously concealed, but now he's revealing. And the mystery is actually what we looked at last week. It was that, that God, through Jesus, was building this thing called the church, which was going to be a people group that transcended every barrier that mankind has erected since we've been around. And, and really, since mankind was created, we have, we have created distinctions between us. And we, we build these walls between skin color, between ethnicity, between socioeconomic class, between you know, income level, between education level, all of these things. But the mystery is that God, through Jesus, in this people group called the church, was going to build something that broke down every wall that we've attempted to build. And there would be this people group, this nation called Christians that transcended every other people group. That's the mystery that, that God had revealed to Paul and it's the calling that God had placed on Paul's life to preach that mystery, to welcome the Gentiles into the family of God. And in verse seven, he said, Paul says, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to, procl to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of the Messiah. And this is my second point today. God's grace is given to unworthy people. Praise God, his grace is given to unworthy people or it sure wouldn't have been given to us. Paul's saying in these verses that God in his grace had decided to use Paul to, to get his gospel to the ends of the earth, even though he considered himself to be the least of all the saints. And, and when Paul said that, he wasn't being, he really wasn't being self-deprecating. That's not a pity party because when you look at Paul's background, it is increasingly remarkable what God decided to do through his life. Because you look at all the other early church leaders, right? And, and they're, they're fishermen, they're, you know, they're political zealots, they're tax collectors, they're men that certainly had rough backgrounds, but nobody held a candle to the life that Paul lived before Jesus called him out of darkness and into life. When, when Paul was introduced into the word of God, his Roman name Saul, in, uh, in Acts chapter 6, it says that he was breathing threats and murder against the church. I mean, this guy was a... a uh, he was a religious terrorist is what he is. He was basically, you know, uh, an ancient day leader in ISIS. And so he oversaw the execution of the first Christian martyr. And he was so, he was such a fanatic about ending Christianity that he was willing to travel 35 miles from where he was to the next town over Damascus just to round up people that he thought might be Christians to either throw them in prison or kill them. But before he got to Damascus, he was very famously in Acts chapter 9 interrupted by Jesus where Jesus stood before him and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He probably heard that story before. And the danger with hearing, hearing stories in the Bible your whole life is you, you hear them and you normalize them and you sort of strip them of all their power. I can tell you when Jesus stood before Saul, he didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's not how that conversation went. The risen son of God appeared to this man, blinded him, knocked him squarely on his back and said, Saul, this time, all this time, you have not been persecuting Christians. You have been personally persecuting the Son of God. Yeah, I've been convicted of my sin on multiple occasions throughout my life to the point that it actually hurt me. It actually reduced me to tears but what I have never and will never have any concept of is what Paul faced that day on the road to Damascus. This was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees who was working himself to the bone to try to make himself right with God. He'd memorized the Torah. He had set himself apart. And his whole life he thought that he'd been honoring God, that he'd been pleasing God, that he'd been doing the work of God. And then he finds out very abruptly in one moment, the most painful and most important moment of his life, that all the work that he put in, not only was it useless, but it actually made him an enemy of God. And the God that he thought he was serving, he found out he was actually personally persecuting, doing harm to and that's what makes God's grace so much more amazing. That's why Paul says he considers himself to be the least of all the saints. Because he had personally wounded and persecuted Jesus prior to being used by Jesus. But that's what makes God's grace that much more amazing. This is Paul saying, despite the hole that I dug myself into... 
And despite the fact that I had utterly and entirely ruined my life, despite the fact that I had completely screwed this thing up in every way possible, God decided to do something amazing in my life to bring me into his family and use me in his kingdom. The God of the Bible always, it just never ceases to amaze me how surprisingly he chooses to operate. And, and so many times people read the Bible as though it's a story of, of you know, the, the best people making their way to God. What a joke. I mean, what a joke. You go all the way back to Genesis 12, and you see God calling a man named Abraham to be the father of the Jewish nation. Not once, but twice, the man completely abandoned his wife because he got scared. I don't know how he ever looked Sarah in the eye after that. And he's held up as this paragon of faith and virtue. <laughs> but God decided to use him anyway. You know, or you look at King David, widely celebrated. I mean, when the, the, the years when King David sat on the throne of Israel for the, for the Israelites, that was the good old days. There was, that was the golden years. And look at David in his darkest hour, ready to take, not only take another man's wife, but have a man murdered to cover his own tracks. And this is the man that God chose to sit on the throne. This is the man that God said, that's a man after my own heart. That's the man that God was ready to restore the moment he was willing to repent. You go to the New Testament and you see the same exact thing. You, like every once in a while, you should just ask yourself, why does God choose to do the things that he does? It's to reveal things about himself. That's why. Look, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches the most effective sermon in the history of Christendom. This fisherman paints this unbelievably articulate, eloquent, intelligent tapestry of a sermon where he walks through the entire meta narrative of scripture and arrives at Jesus Christ and how God has proven by raising him from the dead that he really is the king of kings and the lord of lords and at the end of this sermon when he drops the mic 3,000 people give their lives to Jesus and this thing called the church is born and it's easy to say man Peter must have been a great guy days before God used him to preach that sermon Peter was denying even knowing who Jesus was Time after time after time, it's his grace that he gives to unworthy people. Jesus said when he came down here, he was not looking for righteous people. He came for the unrighteous. And if he didn't, he would have never come for you and me. The Pharisees mocked Jesus. And in derision said that he was a friend of sinners. Praise God that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Or he would be no friend to me or you. Amen. 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 Man, that's good news. And that's all Paul is saying here. Because I'm sure he knew that this fledgling group of believers in Ephesus would, 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 would begin to, to develop, you know, to degenerate back into what we all naturally go into, to the works-based way of living, where God loves me if I do good this week. He doesn't like me anymore if I do bad next week. This is Paul saying, listen, there's not a, there's not a mistake that, that I didn't make, that God didn't make up for when he gave me his grace. And, and maybe you've asked yourself, I, I know you have, because we're all made of the same stuff. I've asked myself this. And after however many sessions when people come into my office, they always get around to admitting that they've asked themselves this. You've asked yourself a time or two how God could use somebody like you. The answer to that question is found in the Bible. Read the Bible and you'll see how he can use people like you. He's always used people like you. People exactly as flawed, as frail, as sinful, as broken, as insecure, as short-sighted, as messed up as you, because those are the only people he's ever had to choose from. The only people he's ever had to choose from. And, and, and the reason why I'm convinced that Paul would be used by God to get the gospel to the ends of the earth, the most successful missionary in the known universe apart from Jesus Christ, the reason that Paul, that, that God would turn his life around, would choose to turn a murderer into a missionary is just to show us that there's no such thing as somebody who's too far gone. Whatever anyone has told you, whatever you are struggling with or dealing with, or whether you've talked to anybody about it or not, there's no such thing as somebody who's too far gone if you're willing to hand it over to God. He gives his grace to unworthy people. The only requirement is admitting how unworthy you are. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me close down here today. And in verses 12 and 13, he says, In him we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. And, and really in these final verses, what you see, you see the heart of Paul come out. I mean, this is a guy that's going through, who knows what he's going through in, in, in a Roman jail cell. 
uh, but, but it wasn't a five-star hotel. But even despite the fact that, you know, whatever he had going on on his plate, however he was being treated, whatever he was subjected to, the only thing he cared about is these people in Ephesus worrying about him. Because, because Paul knew something about suffering. See, it's one thing, you know this, it's one thing for you to suffer personally and deal with something, but it's a whole other ball game when someone that you love is suffering and you're powerless to do anything about it. You, have you been there? I remember distinctly when, when um, man, this made me think of, uh, well, well, I'll just tell you. When, uh, when it was time to go to the hospital, when, when, when Katie was getting ready to have Everett, when he was getting ready to arrive on the scene, I, I was sick as a dog, and Katie got me up about 10 p.m. that night and said, hey, it's time to roll. And I had a big old beard at the time, and I knew she hated it, so I asked her, you want me to knock this thing back before we go to the hospital? She said, yeah, do business. So I had to knock my beard off, and then we, we, um, we hit the road about 10, 30, 11 p.m. that night. And so we were, we were cruising down Route 2, and, um, and things were beginning to get lively, and we were about at the community college, and I actually thought I was going to have to pull over and, you know, set hut and do this thing myself, which, um, as a firefighter, I delivered a baby in the back of an ambulance, and so I said, all right, this is what God's prepared me for, let's do this thing, but, uh, and I, so I had a little bit of confidence going on, probably because I was still tired, a little bit out of my head. Well, then we got to the hospital, then we got to the hospital, and things began to get real, church, because they had us walk around the L&D unit for an hour, and, and, and when we did, you know, to kind of move things along, and so when we, when we were walking around, and, you know, Katie's doing the, the prego walk, and she's, you know, taking a few steps, and kind of, you know, surfing along the, the, the rails, God bless her, I heard something behind closed doors, a, a noise that I didn't know a human being could make, and I started hearing these blood-curdling screams from these other, uh, these other I guess they were people. They didn't, say, they didn't sound like they came from a human. Uh, and then I started to realize, hey, Ryan, maybe you're not ready for this. Meanwhile, like I had to do anything, right? I'm just, I'm just there for Katie, and I'm getting ready to have an emotional breakdown myself. So, so we, uh, I mean, we, he, and here's the thing about Katie, because <laughs> this is what I wasn't prepared for. My wife is a tough lady, and I'm not, okay? Like, and I don't, I don't, I'm not insecure enough to need to front. I'm just not, okay? My wife doesn't really complain when she's in a whole lot of pain. I get a fever of like 99.1 and I'm ready to start writing a will and stepping into the light, okay? And she doesn't have a ton of compassion for me, which, yeah, I'm, I'm working through a little bit of emotional scars. I've never really seen my wife in an inordinate amount of pain. And when we, when we had Everett, things were okay. We got the epidural and, you know, Katie didn't even yell. I was... It was crazy. But then we had Scarlett, and we de- she decided, we didn't decide, she decided to do things without the epidural. And hey, I'm in the passenger seat. That's not my call. But for the first time in my life, I saw my wife in, in, in pain like I've never seen before. And hear me, I'm not stupid enough to say that this was harder on me than it was her. That's not the point of this. The point is, you know, physically that was the worst thing that she's ever gone through, but I'd never experienced anything like that either. Because a woman that I loved was sitting in a bed going through what looked like hell, what sounded like, you know, something that I'm never going to be able to experience, and I, cu- I couldn't do a thing about it. The, actually, the nursing staff had me go sit in the corner because they thought I was going to haul off and hit one of them, and I wasn't far from it, just between you and me. Uh, and, and, you know, praise God, everything worked out, but I experienced that kind of suffering that Paul is trying to spare the Ephesian believers uh, in, because when you know that somebody that you love is going through something that you can't do anything about, it just has a way of tearing you up. And so in these final verses, Paul is saying he's trying to spare the Ephesians from that. And what these, what these final two verses show us is my final point today, it's that the gospel never leaves us without hope. It never leaves us without hope, church. And there's two reasons why. Verse 12 says, in him we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. This is Paul saying, hey, I might be in a Roman jail cell, far removed from from everyone that I love and everyone that loves me, but the one thing that goes with us into every situation and circumstance and season in life is that we always have confident, bold access to our God. That's what Jesus Christ purchased for us at Calvary. You may not feel like you have freedom. You may, not, you may feel like you don't have an easy way out to whatever you're in. You may feel like you're trapped. But the one thing that you will never, you will never be without God as a child of God. Your, your, your access to God will never be blocked. Hebrews tells us that we can approach the throne of grace with boldness. And Paul's saying, don't worry about me. Because Jesus has already secured my freedom, whether or not I experience it on this side of eternity or not. And in verse 13... He closes down, he says, I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf. He says, for they are your glory. And the second reason that the gospel never leaves us without hope is because in our our walks with God, as we keep our eyes on our Savior, one thing we are promised 
is that none of our suffering is ever meaningless. There's nothing harder when you walk through something that you can't see the end of, something extraordinarily painful, something that doesn't make any sense to you. There's nothing more damaging than when you begin to believe that this does not have a purpose, that this does not have a meaning. Paul never believed that lie. He never believed that everything that God brought into his life, you have to remember this is an, Paul was bred to be an evangelist. He was bred to, he's a pace horse. What he loved, his wheelhouse was being out on the road, traveling from town to town, preaching the gospel, whatever the cost was to him. To lock him in a jail cell would have been a death sentence for so many people. And, and his Ephesian family knew that about him. And so the tendency is to look at Paul's life and say, what's the purpose behind this? How could God possibly redeem this? And without even even knowing how God would work it out, Paul simply knew that he would. He said, I know that this is going to work out for your glory. And when you zoom out from Paul's life, history teaches us that he was right. Because simply because God slowed down Paul long enough to sit in a Roman jail cell, we have an Ephesian letter. And if Paul never experienced the suffering of that jail cell, we wouldn't have this. We also wouldn't have Philippians. We wouldn't have Colossians or Philemon. Simply because God slowed him down, he was able to use Paul in an unbelievably powerful way that he didn't see. He just believed would eventually be there. And this is exactly what Paul promises followers of Jesus in Romans when we're told that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. This is the power of God. He doesn't need you to have a perfect life this side of eternity. You don't need to, to have a life in which every day is better than the last. God can take even the painful things he can take even the things that you don't see a purpose in. He can take even the suffering, even the tears, even the loss, and he can bring it all together. And on the other side of eternity, what we'll know is that it was not meaningless. I don't know where you're coming from today or what you're bringing to the table today, but I know that in, in, in Ephesians 3, 1 through 13, we have three truths that go beyond anything that God calls us to walk through. Number one, it's that nothing can change who Jesus has made us. Nothing can take that identity away from us. Not our performance this week, not our circumstance, not our loss or gain of anything. We are who Jesus has made us to be and that will never change. God has given grace to unworthy people. You didn't earn this, you can't unearn this. And thirdly and finally, you are never without hope. And there is nothing that God will walk you through that doesn't ultimately have a purpose that he can't ultimately use for your good. So keep 